Hi, this is Kent Vaughn with Blaze Performance Solutions. We're excited to share this webinar with you today, Leading Remote Teams with Excellence. Truly, we are in unusual times today. The coronavirus, earthquakes, tornadoes, financial concerns, the list goes on and on, and yet, we all still want to be successful in 2020, don't we? And that's why we say we need to retain 2020 vision on what? On our goals and strategies for the year, how to bridge the gap from those across everything that's going on to better and more consistent results. We really work in three areas in an organization to help them do this. We help them learn effectively using micro learning that really takes the complex and makes it simple by helping organizations execute more consistently with a focus on how do you do everything to change behavior, not just so people know something more, but actually do something about it. And finally, from the very beginning, how do we leverage in accountability and coaching processes and tools to help people be more accountable in some very positive and amazing ways? We all want that. Now, today we're going to actually talk about content from two of our books, Everyone Can Lead and The Three Keys of Execution. We're really excited about those that are available on Amazon. The Three Keys of Execution last year, a month after it came out, was listed by Inc. Magazine as one of the top seven books to read. So we we're excited about that, excited to share some content with you today. Let's move now to the whole reason we're having this webinar, the topic of leading remote teams with excellence. So what can you expect from this? Well, here's what we call the key three. Lead yourself, lead others, and get results. No matter what's happening, I've got to take care of all of those things and if I'm going to be successful. Now, let me just say something about leadership here. We believe that leadership isn't a really a title at all. There are plenty of people that have a title that aren't very good leaders. So we believe no matter who you are, no matter what your job, you gotta lead yourself, you gotta lead other people on your team even. Uh, some of the very best leaders are those that are leaders we might call de facto leaders, that people, wow, when they talk, they listen to them. So. As we jump into this, let me just share with you an interesting statistic. In the United States, in the month of February of 2020, there were 4.6 people working from home. That number is projected to rise to as much as 30% over the next couple of months, according to the Atlantic Magazine. Now, I don't know what the number is around the world, but here's what I know with certainty. There are a lot more people working from home today than there were last month. We need to get good at this. Now, some of us, myself personally, have been doing it for decades, but a lot of people haven't. So how can we help ourselves? So let's talk about lead yourself first. What are some things you can do to have your own act together? This is a really big deal. If I'm gonna lead effectively, I've gotta have my own stuff together. You see this busy guy, his child's there, and he's trying to juggle his job and have a conversation with one of his employees. And well, we, we all know that life, right? and you've tried to work from home, and the kids are out of school, et cetera, et cetera. Well, first of all, you've got to keep a consistent schedule. When are you going to start in the morning? You're going to start at 8, 30, 9, 8. When is it? Plan for it. Get up. Do your regular morning routine. Get dressed for work. Make sure your workspace is organized. Be consistent. Expect that there are going to be some interruptions. We have a, another webinar we did earlier this week about uh, how to work remote with excellence. So, just getting my own act together, that whole webinar was about that. But again, as a leader, you really gotta have a consistent schedule. Um, and, and one of the things we'd say is, even if you have friends or family at home, which a lot of people do, make sure they understand what the schedule is. How are we gonna make this work? What, what are we gonna do? Second, plan and prioritize your own work. Now, we've all heard about planning and prioritizing for years. It doesn't mean we're necessarily good at it though. So let's talk about that. Simple way to say this is plan your work and work your plan. So first, pause. Take time to breathe, oxygen, oxygenate your brain, and increase intentionality about what are you trying to accomplish, what are you trying to do. We found it's really great to begin or end the day with this. Spend a little time by yourself. If there are a lot of people around you, wherever you're working, take some time by yourself to think through what? Well, think through. What are all the tasks that need to be done? They need to be completed today. Write them down. Now, write them down could just as easily be type them into a list on my phone or on my computer. We're not saying you have to use pen and paper, but putting them down. Ben Franklin said years ago, the, the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory. 
Well, the idea is how many times you've had a great idea and you later forgot about it. So just write it down, type it on your phone, put it somewhere where you'll be able to get back to it. And then place them in order of importance. They're not all the same level of importance. So what is the importance? Now, the importance could be based on what your boss thinks, your customers think, or whomever. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But you got to prioritize. And number three, pursue. Start working on priority number one. Focus on the most important things, not just being busy. We all have had days where at the end of the day, we thought, man, I need anything done today. The reason we felt that way is because we didn't get some of the most important things done. And they really, it really frustrated us and worried us. So to help us with that, we're going to talk about a tool called the Eisenhower Time Matrix. Now, you may have seen this. A lot of different organizations have had this in their time management programs for decades. But where this really came from is Dwight D. Eisenhower. In the late 40s, when he was running for president, he was a world-renowned general. People loved him and had tremendous success during two world wars. He was asked why he was so successful. This was just before he was elected as president. And he said, I've often found that those things that are important are often not urgent. And those things that are urgent are, are not all that important. Sounds like some things a lot of other people have quoted over the years. And it's still true, isn't it? So he built this little time matrix with four quadrants to help him as he was organizing his day to identify what he was going to do and what the things that came up all day, every day. So you will see with this little time matrix on the left side here, red, green, yellow, and blue, that's maybe kind of orange, that across the top, horizontal, there is uh, the caption, urgent. On the left side, very urgent. On the right side, not so urgent, right? On the left side, the left axis, uh, up and down, vertically, is importance. The top left, very important, high importance. The bottom left, low importance, not so important. So let's talk about each one of these individually. And it's a great way to deal with the things that come up every day, but it's also a great way to prioritize what you need to do and what you need to accomplish. So let's start in the top left, quadrant one, and we're going to go counterclockwise. Starting quadrant one, here are things, and why? Because we're going to talk about the two quadrants that are urgent first. Quadrant one, these are things that are urgent and they're important. A customer needs it. Your boss needs it. The house is on fire. I don't know. Heaven forbid that should happen for you. But just do it. It's important and it's an urgent. Just do it. Now, if you have multiple of these on your list for today, then uh, prioritize them, you know, one, two, three, four, whatever. When new things come up throughout the day, new interruptions, new things happen, and someone brings you something, take a minute and think about, it. is this urgent? First, I'd say, is it important, right? Is it important? Whoever's coming to you with it probably thinks it's urgent, but is it important and is it urgent? If it is urgent and it is important, then you probably need to do it. You may have to negotiate. Say, hey, I've got these three other things that have got to be out this afternoon by five. You know, do some negotiating then with the person that's asking you. Now, let's drop down to quadrant three on the bottom left. Many organizations would say these are just time wasters. Well, the fact is, often you will get things that are important to someone, but they're not important to you. And they're certainly urgent to them. And because they're urgent to them, they want them to be urgent to you. Now, sometimes you'll choose to do these because the, import, the person is so important, you choose to do them. I totally understand that. But it may also be that there are things that you want to think about delegating or pushing back, meaning negotiating. Say, hey, you know, I know it's a really big deal to you. I've got these other six things I'm trying to get done today by noon. Let's talk about that. Is there someone else who would be better served with that? I'll, I'll tell you, this has happened to me a million times over the years. I'll ask someone to do something on my team and they'll say, hey, well, I'm doing da 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 And I go, oh, those three things? Oh, do those instead, I'm gonna keep this. Or do those instead, let me ask someone else to do that. So that, when they get come to you with this, is now the time to talk about delegating or pushing back. Right then, if you take this and say you're gonna handle it, if you don't do it later, you're the one that's gonna look bad, right? So great way to here negotiate and delegate if it's the right time. What Eisenhower said is there are often things that come up that I'm not the one that I'd be doing it as a five-star general, but a colonel on my team should be doing it. A captain that works several levels below me should be doing it, and he would delegate that, right? So deal with those effectively as they come in all day. Quadrant four, here's the quadrant where we have things that are neither important nor are they urgent, but we're so tired from a long day, we end up doing them. Or as my son, who's a senior in college says, you know, I got done with my homework. I have a report to do tomorrow. I decided to take an hour break and watch Netflix for a little bit and then do the report later. 
And four hours later, I'm still watching Netflix. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> well, that's because he didn't have a little rule like uh, I'm going to watch one Netflix show when it's over. I'm going to go back to my report that I need to get done or something. There's nothing wrong with relaxing and chilling out, etc. But I would say relaxing, chilling out, watching a show on Netflix or anything else for that matter is not something that's not important or urgent. It's something that is important. You need to take care of yourself. You need to rest. You need to relax. You need to get enough sleep. Have you ever been too busy driving? Someone heard to get somewhere. They didn't stop to get gas. <laughs> That's crazy. It's important, it's just not urgent. Now when the light comes on saying you're out of gas, now it's urgent, right? So that's what quadrant two is all about. If we go to the top right, the green quadrant. These are things that are important, but are not urgent yet. And what we'd say, certainly what Eisenhower said is schedule it, set time for it. Here's what I know about, for example, exercise. If I get out my workout clothes the night before and put them out on the bathroom counter, I'll go to the gym. 99% probability. If I don't get the workout clothes, there's a 99% probability I won't go, right? Now, every once in a blue moon, I'll decide not to go. But if I schedule, say in the morning, I'm going to go at 6 a.m., get my clothes out the night before, get ready, I go, right? Same with reports, same with follow-up, same with calls, same with all the kinds of things. There are a lot of things that you're going to be, need to be doing over the next little while working remotely that you wouldn't have had to do otherwise, that you'd be a lot more intentional about, like, following up with your customers, like following up with your employees, like having conversations and communicating effectively. You put that off long enough, there are going to be problems. And frankly, nobody wants problems. Nobody wants those at all. So let's move on. That is the first, those are the first two steps for leading yourself. The next two are be flexible and stay positive. Let's start be flexible. Working from home, people on your team are going to have interruptions they've never had before in their entire lives. Be flexible about what needs to be done and when it needs to be done. Now, there are people on your team that need to work certain hours. They're customer service reps. They are HR professionals who need to deal with employee issues. They're payroll clerks or whatever, and they need to work at certain times. So when people call, they have someone taking care of them. Great. Make sure they understand that. Make sure they understand the expectations. There are a whole host of other people that you work with that if they don't get it done between eight and five, maybe it's not a big deal because it's not due till Monday of next week. So maybe if they do it at 10 o'clock tonight, you don't care. They, they get their kids in the bed and then they work on it. So be flexible, be understanding that there are going to be interruptions like nobody else. Expect those interruptions and be flexible with what people are doing and how they're doing it. I mean, we understand there's certain things you can't be flexible about. Make sure people understand what those are. But if you're draconian about every single thing that you expect people to do when they were in the office and the time they were supposed to do it, it becomes almost untenable. Finally, stay positive. Can't say enough about staying positive. It is amazing how we can get concerned about all of the issues going on around us and let that kind of negatively impact us in some very real ways. We, we all need to stay positive. Yeah, there's stuff on the news and here and there and everywhere. Don't let that blindside you. Don't let that cause you to lose sight of, hey, we're going to be successful here. We're going to get results here. We're going to do the things we need to get done here. Be positive. Stay positive. Uh, I, I'm not saying be Pollyanna and, and say there aren't problems or issues. There are issues. There are things going on. But let's just be real. We, we can be a little more positivity Never hurt anybody. A little more positivity. Yeah, there are problems uh, than issues. Uh, we worked with a client last fall who said, we don't have any problems. We have opportunities. That's a great way to put it. We have opportunities around us. What can we do about those opportunities? So lead yourself. Make sure you have your own act together. These aren't the only things, but this, these are some great ways to start. Great areas to make sure you're working on to help yourself be successful at leading your own life. Number two. Lead your team. Be a coach and a cheerleader, not a critic. It is amazing how when people get frustrated, worried, stressed, et cetera, we devolve into being a critic. We say that most people need a lot less criticism and a lot more coaching and cheerleading. So when we think about leading your team, there are really three big ideas we want to talk about here. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Build your culture and finally ensure engagement. 
So let's jump into the first one, communicate, communicate, communicate. Several things I wanna talk about here. Let's go through them together. First of all, you might really wanna think seriously about having a team Zoom call, at least at the beginning, maybe at the end of the week, maybe even every day. Now, we're not trying to sell you on Zoom. You might use Slack or any number of other tools that are out there, but it's really great if you can have these calls where people can actually literally see each other face to face. And you can say, hey, we don't care if you're in your t-shirt or your hair's messed up or whatever else, but communicate, communicate. This is new for everyone. And, and let me just say something about this. Given a lack of information in your experience, what do people tend to assume, positive or negative intent? I can assure you it's almost always negative. Without information, people think, wow, there's a problem. There's something going on here. So when in doubt, over communicate. Now that's a little bit of a negative term, right? But what we're saying is make sure people really understand what's going on, you know, what, what's going on here. Make sure that people know what tools or processes that are most effective for communicating. You may find that you use a lot more texting now or Slack or other tools than you do when people were in the office. Fine, great. Make sure people just understand what are the tools and the processes we're going to use for, for communication, for solving problems, for whatever else. Yeah, inspire, remind them why we're doing this, what, why we're doing what we're doing. Educate them, share best practices, share, them with, share with them things you're learning, ask them to share what they're learning and motivate, give shout outs to each other, high fives. There's a, a great new, new book about sharing gratitude from Adrian Gostich and uh, Chelton Esther, I, I'm sorry, El, Chel, Chester Elton, I think it is, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Bidane, there's Chester. Uh, just came out a few weeks ago. I highly recommend that about showing gratitude to people. We'd highly, highly recommend that as a part of communication that you're communicating positive, motivating, upbeat things. Uh, upbeat things. Now, let me just share a couple of ideas here. We have one client who recommends that they have once a week a uh, kind of a state of the union call where we're talking about business, we're talking about projects, we're talking about initiatives, what's going on with our team and in the organization. And then they focus on a cheerleader call where once a week they're sharing, hey, what's working, what's not working, best practices, wins, challenges people are facing. And it's not really about the projects or the initiatives, but it's really more, hey, kind of motivate and, 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 and excite people. And now, another thing to think about here with communication is uh, email, because goodness knows people get a lot of emails, right? What I have found is that when I have something that's an extremely high priority that I really need someone to look at right now, I will put something like Q1 in the email, or if people don't know Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, <coughs> excuse me, from the Eisenhower time matrix, then I'll just say, need your attention today, need your answer today, or 911 or whatever you use, something in the email. You can also say it's Q2, it's important, it's not urgent, need this by Tuesday. If you introduce in the subject line that idea, you give people a great way to prioritize these things as they come up. Now, the fact is everyone's gonna have all kinds of different interruptions, we've talked about that, right? But let me just share this idea. If someone needs to spread out their work over the day, then okay, then many jobs, that's okay, that works out fine, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's imagine, that you're an employee who's working from home and you've got two kids that are home from school as well. And they're, you know, second and fourth graders. And they need a lot of hand holdings throughout the day. If they understand that here's my schedule, uh, I've got some calls from 8.30 to 9.30, then I'm going to take a 10 minute break and we're going to talk about a couple of things, checking how you're doing. And, and, and you lay out the schedule with them and they know that you're going to take some time for them. We're going to have lunch later. We're going to spend some time doing whatever it is later. And you, and you don't you don't tell them just what later is. But you, <clears throat> you tell them at the end of this TV program on Disney Plus, we're going to talk. Or you set the timer on the microwave or something. But communicating the schedule and that you are going to give them some time. It's when people don't know when to get a hold of you and don't know they're going to have your time. They run in with everything. I'm not saying there's still not kind of interruptions of people running in, but it sure is a lot better if people have a better understanding about the schedule on the front end. Now, I have a personal rule switching gears on you there. And that is if I get two emails or two texts from someone about some topic and I'm still not understanding, I pick up the phone and call them. One of my business partners, David Williams, does it once. If, if you send one text, one email, and he doesn't get it, then he'll pick up the phone and call you. I, did, I have two. I'm not saying what's the right number, but 
I, I don't continue to email and text or send messages on Slack or whatever else, expecting people, if I, if I continue to define it for them, they're going to get it better. Usually I don't because for whatever reason, I'm just not communicating well. You see, the biggest problem with communication is the assumption that it occurred. Yeah. You assume, I assume that they understood the words that are coming out of your mouth, but for whatever reason, they may not. Years ago, my wife said to me, when I, after I said to her, baby, you're not listening to me. She said, I'm listening fine. I just don't, I don't have any idea what you're saying. And sometimes that's what happens in organizations. So make sure that you're really communicating effectively, that people understand that uh, if you don't understand, you're going to ask. And if they don't understand, they're going to ask. And understanding is not just repeating the words back. It's making sure they understand, you know, what's expected from them, et cetera. Finally, as I think about communicate, I would ask you to think about this idea. Assume the best in your people, not the worst. Don't become an autocrat. Yes, there's stress, there's concern, there's worry, but, but assume the best. I, I know with the fact that people rise to the level of expectation we have for them. Maybe not everybody, but most people do. Now, that leads up to this next point under lead others well, which is build a culture. It's the leader's responsibility to craft the environment with which their team operates in. You must be intentional about what you're doing to develop and improve your culture. Now, culture, if you think about it, is really simply the combined behaviors of everybody on your team. Now, when you're working in a new environment, in a new world, as it were, you want to make sure that you're doing things to build the culture of your team and your organization by definition. So I'd ask you to think about a few ideas. Shout outs and high fives. In our book, we talk about high fives in uh, the new book about gratitude from Gostich and Elton, it talks about shout outs. Highly recommend that you create a forum where people can share what they're doing. They can give each other high fives and share the best things that are going on. Share accomplishments. Uh, we'd say, what are the actions and behaviors everyone takes every, every day about their goals? And what are they doing about those? Sharing those with each other and sharing wins and showing appreciation and gratitude makes all the difference in the world in a culture, uh, in creating a, a good culture, an effective culture in your organizations. We're not saying be Pollyanna here, but what we are saying is get very intentional about thanking people for what they do specifically. Instead of saying, great job, great job on that report, great job on how you handle that customer service problem. Thank you for da, 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 X, Y, and Z, right? The more specificity you give for the gratitude and the thankfulness, the more they're going to reinforce that. I mean, here's a simple and a goofy way to remember it. I put on a, coat, a, a shirt today out of the closet, and the last time I put on the shirt, my wife said, wow, I really like that shirt. What did I think of when I reached into my closet to put on a shirt today? Oh, last time I wore that shirt, my wife said, wow, I love that shirt. That's exactly what I thought of. Well, that's exactly what we're saying when you share with someone something specific they did well, the next time they're going to think, wow, I want to do more of that. I want to get a little more gratitude, a little more appreciation. Building the culture. As a leader, you own it. By the way, whether you do something about it or not, you're still creating the culture. You're creating it by what you do or don't do every day, all day, every day. So be very intentional about what kind of culture am I creating. And when you mess up as a leader, be quick to say, I'm sorry. Say, I, I didn't handle that well. I apologize. I'm going to do this differently next time. <clears throat> Here's the things I find most helpful. When there's been a problem, admit there was a problem. Admit how you made a mistake. Admit what you learned. Share with what you learned and what you're going to do differently. Uh, one of my sons called the other day about a concern he had with his boss. I said, I'd call him up and say, here's how I messed up. Here's what I've learned. Here's what I'll do differently next time. By the way, when you have an employee who does that, you can do anything because they are recognizing that they're making a mistake, but they also recognize and trying to learn and also trying to get better at what they're going to do. Well, that's, that is a great culture when you can do that. When people aren't afraid to share not only the wins, but also the, the concerns, the failures, the worries, the issues. So the last part I want to talk about when it comes to leading others effectively is ensuring engagement. There are lots of ways to impact engagement. I will tell you, frankly, the best way to have engaged teams is to be winning as a team, right? But you need to be realizing and remember that there are four big areas that everyone thinks about when they think about engagement in their own jobs, in their own lives. Number one, do they feel valued? 
well, for doing the things we just talked about, thanking them for what they're doing, showing gratitude, helping them get better, they're going to feel valued. Lots of ways to show value. Number two, do they feel connected to others? Now, some people like to work on their own, don't, not, don't want to be interrupted. Totally get that. Understand that. Some people feel much better when they're interacting with people a lot, having lots of conversations, et cetera. You have to figure out a happy balance there, but people need to feel connected to a team, our team, our goals, our results, our clients, not my, 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 or worse, your, your, your. I had a wonderful friend work with me years ago. We became friends. And uh, she's, when we first started working, she'd say, your goals, your goals. And said, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, it's the team. It's our goals. It's our goals. It took a while to break her the habit of that, but she finally got it. They were our goals and our success, not my success. The next pillar of engagement that's really important to remember is people want to make a difference. By definition, people want to contribute. They want to see how they are making a difference specifically. And as you continue co to connect the entire team together, sharing best practices, showing wins and what people are doing, they can see how they're making a difference. And when you thank them for something specific they did, they can see how they in fact are contributing and they are making a difference. And finally, the fourth pillar is growing personally and professionally. Everybody wants to grow personally and professionally. That doesn't mean they want to be the CEO, but it does mean they want to get better at their job and have more opportunities to be successful or do it better and go home early, right? Except now they're working for more many of them. So everybody wants to be growing. It's different to different people, right? But they want to be growing. I, I remember in business school years ago, I had this professor who was fantastic. He was a retired executive with Westinghouse. And he said, here's the biggest problem for you MBA students. You all think that and want to, in the next 10 years, be the CEO. The problem is a lot of people that work for you don't care anything about being the CEO. They just want to do well at their job now. And so if you think they're operating from the same mindset as you, you're going to have a problem. So as you think about your employees, think about, are you showing that you value them? And, and are you making sure everybody's connected and they're contributing? They know how they're contributing. They know how they're making a difference and how they're growing. By the way, if you're someone on a team and you're not the leader, you can do the, all of this just as well. You can thank people. You can show how they're valued and how they're making a difference. And you can do all kinds of these things, right? You don't have to be a leader to do this. These are so important for everyone to be thinking about. Again, it goes back to that inspire, educate, motivate idea. Every day, are you offering people a little inspiration, a little motivation? I hope you are. Because that is a really, really big deal. Again, I'd like you to think about the simple idea of being a cheerleader, not a critic. Cheerleader, every day, are you cheering your people on? Are you thanking them for what they're doing? Are you offering appreciation? Well, you might say, well, I'll tell them there's a problem. Okay, fine. And some people that way. And some people say, you don't need to tell me all that. I'm fine. They don't need that reinforcement. You know what? Fine. Do it until they tell you that. If they tell you that, then fine. Deal with that person differently. You know? Everybody has different things they they like in terms of recognition. Some people recognition of them is give me a plaque. Some of it's make a video about me and put me on the company website. Some people it's just give me more money in my paycheck. Fine. But the more you know about how, what makes people tick, the better. If there's something you need to have a conversation with someone about that they haven't done well, instead of going and being critical, I would just go and have a, a conversation with them very calmly, no emotion. By the way, the more emotion you have in a conversation, the less communication happens. I'm going to say that again. The more emotion you have in a conversation, the less communication happens, at least if it's negative emotion, right? So call them up, set up a time to have a conversation and say, hey, there's an issue here. I didn't get that report or I didn't see this or I didn't get this. There's a problem. No emotion. Just tell them what's going on and then ask them what's going on. What, what's happening? And they'll say, hey, my child got sick. I had to take him to the doctor. You know, hey, the bank call, I need to go deposit some money. I don't know they're going to tell you something. Now, once you've got that information, now the two of you together can figure out how to solve the issue, right? What are we going to do about this? Maybe it's you're not going to have them do it. You're going to have someone else do it because they have too many things going on because they have this huge project that is now, you know, blown up as it were, and they've got to spend a lot of extra time on it. Or, or maybe it's just going to have to re refigure the deadline or who knows what, right? But you won't know it unless you go in very calmly and have a conversation and say, hey, didn't get this thing I was expecting or that didn't go the way I'd hoped. What's going on? Now that you have that, figure out together what you're going to do about it. 
it's a lot better than being the ultimate judge and critic, the judge and jury who condemns people because they're, they failed at something. By the way, my experience has been when people make a mistake, they almost always know they made a mistake. They don't need Kent Vaughn to jump on them with all four feet. They may, may need my help solving it. They may need my help getting better at it. But going in and say, hey, you screwed this thing up. Really, duh, as if I didn't know that, right? So I would say that what do you do? You make sure you set expectations. Make sure that you hold people accountable on those. We'll talk about that in, in the last area we're going to talk about. And finally, uh, when in doubt, appreciate. You see, all this isn't about managing people at all. You don't manage people. You lead people. But it is about managing expectations. What are the expectations you have, they have? The more everyone's crystal clear about the expectations, the better the results are going to be. And so with that, that leads us to the last topic about how to lead effectively, whether it's remote or not. But it is get results. It is win as a team. We won. We won. When I was a boy, I heard a, a, a football coach, Bear Bryant, say, when the team wins, we won. When the team loses, I failed. I thought that was interesting. He took that on his shoulders. When the team wins, we won. When the team fails, I failed the team in some way or another. And that was his mindset. So how could he help them, coach them, whatever? So get results. When we think about get results, there are really, uh, this content comes out of our book, The Three Keys of Execution. There are really three keys of execution in action here. Number one, simplicity. Number two, visibility. And number three, accountability. So let's just back up and talk about each one of those individually for a couple minutes. Simplicity. Make sure everyone understands what are the goals? What are the expectations? Number one, what? Number two, why? Why are those the goals? Why are those the expectations? And number three, my, my, my. What do you want them to do? Do they understand their part of the goal, the project, the initiative, the expectations, right? That's why I like to call it what, why, and my. What is it? Why are we doing it? What's my part? You see, so many times, literally thousands of times, I've heard people say, I understand the goal, but I don't understand how I can do anything about it. I don't understand my piece of it. I'll tell you a short story about that at the end. We finish that I think really illustrates that well when you do know what happens when everybody understands. So simplicity, they know what the goal is. They know why we're doing it. They understand their part of the goal. Really important. And expectation, you know, when is it due? What, what are we gonna, when are we going to uh, report back about it? Whatever, right? Number two, visibility. It's more important than ever to have these daily check-ins now where people understand every day get a chance to return and report about what they're doing. Now, maybe you have a call with your people. Maybe you have a call with individuals. Maybe you have the report on uh, an email or a text or in Slack or something else. But here's where we're having everybody check in to say, here's what I did about the most important things. Here are the actions and behaviors I took on those goals, those projects, those initiatives. Hey, we're not trying to micromanage here. What we're trying to do is get best practices shared across the team. Because how many times have you thought, wow, that's a great idea. I should try that. Or, wow, that's a great idea. That makes me think of this. I'm going to try this. The more visibility you have on your team, you see, they aren't sitting next to each other anymore. They can't just see it each, each day. But as you have daily check-ins where people can share that, there's some great tools out there where you can do that electronically and where people can just quickly, you know, in the morning while they're waiting for their bagel to bake or their coffee to brew or whatever, they, you know, type in what are the things I did today or yesterday about the top two or three goals. I mean, that, the, the value of that is incalculable. Why? Because it goes back to I feel connected to my team. I can see where I'm contributing and making a difference. And as my team shares best practices and gives me high fives and shout outs, I, I feel valued and I'm even growing and getting better. Finally, the third key of execution is accountability. First and foremost, remove the roadblocks. Remove the roadblocks. There are plenty of roadblocks out there that people are going to experience. So make sure that you as a boss, as a leader, you're constantly looking at how do you remove roadblocks. Or if you're a team member and you hear about a roadblock, you know, make sure to raise the flag. Hey, there's this roadblock. Can you help us with this thing? Don't wait for someone to ask. Let's work on this together. Again, as I said, this isn't about managing people. It's about managing expectations. This isn't about my goals, your goals. It's our goals. Now, 
accountability can be either negative or positive. When my dad was talking to me as a kid, if he ever said, we need to have a chat about that, that was never going to be positive accountability ever. It was going to be some sort of negative accountability. And you want to make sure that as a leader, you're not leading from just negative accountability. You're looking for positive accountability, reinforcing the good things that the people are doing, thanking them for those things. And when there are problems, deal with it. Hey, what's going on? Let's talk about this. <clears throat> in a very calm, even-mannered way, right? It's amazing what you can come up with together. Even if you're the smartest person on the planet, get two other, three other perspectives, two or three other brains in the game. It's amazing how much better things get. Now, let me just warn you about one thing here about accountability. It's a psychological term called diffusion of responsibility. And here's an easy way to think about diffusion of responsibility. Let's imagine <clears throat> that I am an actor playing on Broadway. Not ever going to happen, but let's just imagine I am. Let's imagine that on opening night, there are all these people there out in the crowd. I'm not used to practicing that, and I forget my lines. Later on, when I'm talking to the director, I say to her, well, I, I forgot my lines because there were so many people in the audience. That's kind of absurd, isn't it? She's going to say, you got to remember your lines no matter what. That's, that's what your job is. If I am playing soccer in the World Cup and I miss a goal and I – complain to my coach, I missed the goal because the crowd was too loud or the team opposing team was protecting me too tightly, you know, covering me too tightly. He's going to say, really? Then I need to find an employee. I need to find a player who can do this no matter what's going on in the crowd and what's going on with the opposing team. So all we're saying here is don't let yourself or anyone else blame the circumstances for success. What we always want to know is, what can I do? You see, there are a lot of things we can't control. Totally get that. So what I would ask you to do as a leader is say, okay, so what can we do about it? What can we do about it? This morning we were having a tech issue with a webinar we are going to do on, on Facebook Live. And after an hour and 15 minutes, we just couldn't get it to work the way it worked two days ago. And so we finally said, hey, we're going to have to do something different. We, we can control what we do about it. We can't fix it at the moment, but we can control what we do about it. So as I wrap up this idea, as a, uh, really all of the, uh, these ideas about being an effective leader, lead yourself, lead others, get results. Let me share a story with you, a quick story. Many years ago, an author named Tom Peters was interviewing a doctor named Robert Jarvik. Dr. Jarvik and his team came up with the artificial heart, which is a really big deal because, you know, if people's heart stopped, quit working, unless if you couldn't get a replacement uh, from another person that had passed, you were really in trouble. <clears throat> so they created this artificial heart, which was extremely successful. Tom Peters flew to Louisville, Kentucky to interview Dr. Jarvik and ask him, what did you guys do to have such a great team and be so successful at this? Almost instantly in the interview, the doctor's phone rang and said, hey, Tom, I got to go talk to uh, another doctor about a patient issue. I'll be back in a few minutes. He said, fine, we'll, we'll talk when you get back. Well, Dr. Jarvik left the office. Uh, Tom Peter was, was sitting there by himself, and he heard a knock on the door, and a guy opened the door and said, hey, do you mind if I come in and clean up, empty the garbage, do some other stuff that I do every night to make sure everything's squared away? And he said, sure, sure, come on. The doctor's out checking with another doctor and a patient. So the guy came in, and immediately Tom Peters thought, well, let me ask this guy about what it's like to work for Dr. Jarvik. What kind of team do they have? What's the culture like? What's the engagement like here? What kind of leader is he? After about 60 seconds, Tom said, I could see the guy was getting a little irritated with all of my questions. And finally, he looked me straight in the eyes, straightened up a little bit, straightened his uniform shirt and said, Mr. Peters, it's really simple what we do around here. Me and the doctor, we save lives. We and the doctor, we all save lives. Tom Peters said, I very sheepishly thought, I know exactly what it's like to work on this team, where they have a culture of everyone knows their part and gets thanked for it, appreciated for it, gratitude shown for it. You see, this guy didn't have a medical degree, but his part was essential to the success of their team, was essential to the success of people getting a new heart. Of that, my friends, is what we're talking about here having teams that really are getting far better results together than we would have ever gotten on our own. I want to thank you for your time, for your participation. 
If you have more want more information about this webinar or anything else we do at Blaze Performance Solutions, please reach out to us at info at bps3keys.com. That's kind of not email, info at Blaze Performance Solutions, three keys, three keys of execution, three keys for any goal, three keys of anything we need to learn.com. You can also reach out to us on Facebook at Blaze Performance Solutions or LinkedIn. We look forward to talking to you. Hope you have an utterly amazing 2020 in spite of all that's going around you because frankly, there are a lot of things you can do. Have a great day. Again, this is Kent Vaughn with Blaze Performance Solutions.